Thank you, everyone. Uh, bear with me. Uh, yesterday, I didn't have a voice, so I'm working with what I got today. Um, <clears throat> so I'm a uh, Louisville. Uh, I grew up in Louisville. I went to UK and stayed put. And so uh, I have an older brother. They went to U of L, so we have some great uh, family competition when it comes to some of the ball games. But um, uh, so today, I wanted to talk to you a bit about uh, the work we're doing in, in industrial decarbonization. Um, our background is in industrial byproduct utilization. So um, many times I have an industry showing up with a five gallon bucket of solids saying, hey, we're throwing this away, we're paying a lot of money, what can we do with it? So we develop process systems to divide that out into useful streams and find some commercial avenue in which that product will provide some benefit in production or performance. Um, a lot of those industries are large volume wastes so we naturally we turn to our large volume producer in uh, concrete. Um, over the years, people put a lot of stuff into concrete. Um, I'm quite surprised. I see NASA is working on using astronaut blood and urine and uh, developing uh, hydration products for uh, space travel. That's interesting. Um, but uh, so we develop uh, performance uh, construction materials, and we also like to push the envelope a little bit on developing uh, alternatives to Portland cements. Um, so we'll get into a bit why on looking at uh, decarbonization. Um, you know, the obligatory chart, uh, this is, be great if this is your retirement account, right? <laughs> but uh, indeed it's not, of course, you know, we are well aware of our CO2 increase over the years. I'm um, curious if anyone knows what that little period of decarbonization is right at the top there. Oh. COVID, <laughs> yes, <laughs> good job. Yeah, so, you know, uh, despite the many bad things uh, COVID provided, um, including video conferencing, the, it did provide a period of decarbonization, okay? <coughs> it's very interesting. So a reduction in transportation show a change in habits alone sparks a decarbonization, right? That, that's, that's interesting. But, you know, why bother? There's a lot of industrial emissions going on, and that's sort of the focus that I think a lot of people in this room is what we're trying to do. Uh, process heating, of course, fossil fuels. Uh, electricity generation. Uh, other fuels, so burning rubber tires. And non-energy related processes, uh, being things like calcination of, um, uh, in a cement kiln. And another chart we've seen many of, uh, and a lot of different talks. But the, you know, staying on route as we are, so the business as usual case will take us up to 57 gigatons of CO2 by 2050. Um, of course, we see that charge broken out to many different uh, areas. And we're, we know that there's not one golden nugget out there. And that's why we're here. That's why we all represent many different backgrounds to come up with that combined solution to that target. But regardless, we can't sit and expect things to change. So John uh, pointed out the roadmap, and yes, there's a lot of roadmaps. Uh, I've sat through many talks of different roadmaps. In fact, the guy had a great slide, had roadmap uh, copies just dropping on a slide through like the next three minutes of his talk. It was, it's pretty wild what's out there. But I'm a researcher, and I spent a lot of time watching what DOE is putting out, so I grabbed their four key pillars off a, a recent funding opportunity announcement. Um, and John already covered those, so I, I won't spend time looking at that. And then in that particular funding opportunity announcement, it broke out into these different sectors. Uh, and John also highlighted some of this. Um, chemicals were one of the most intensive as far as industrial CO2 production. Um, and on down the list, you can see that there. Uh, on uh, what else is available in the related uh, greenhouse gas emissions. My background is in cement and concrete, so you can naturally guess where I'm gonna spend some little bit of time talking to you. Um, of course, this shows a little more uh, detailed breakout of uh, industrial sector. So about 30% of CO2 emissions uh, we blame on uh, industrial processes. Yeah, commercial, 17%, residential, 19%, and transportation is around 35%. So you can break out that industry uh, the industrial part and we'll look at the cement and concrete development which is a small fraction about two percent but um, it's, it's pretty intensive small percent um, so let's look at decarbonizing the cement industry 
Cement and concrete is vital. I mean, you'd be pressed to run your day without having some interaction with cement and concrete. Um, roads, runways, bridges, uh, waterways, it's out there, it's prevalent, and it requires a lot of material. Uh, the Portland Cement Association has a roadmap. Um, of course, there's, I mean, every industry is going to have a roadmap focus on what they need to know. Um, so for cement production, uh, clinker, raw materials going into that, the actual manufacturer of the cement, uh, how it's being produced, the temperatures in which it's being produced, uh, the emissions coming off of that cement manufacturing, uh, the actual concrete, what's going into the concrete, what are we blending it with, um, is there a way to reduce the clinker content by diluting it with something else, um, construction practices, you know, what are our expectations from our construction industry? You know, is 20 year design life, is that enough? You know, why spend the CO2 to install that structure to 20 years later, emit that much more CO2 to demolish it and then put it back in again? You know, what are the expectations or what are the materials, abilities uh, that we currently have or could have to extend that design life? And then carbonation, yeah. Um, concrete, cement, when it hydrates, it loves to carbonate, um, some more than others. Um, and there's a lot of good companies out there that are capitalizing on that, um, Carbon Cure for Wine, and some other uh, industries that are looking to uh, store carbon in uh, our cement and concrete. I thought this was interesting, and I realize the charts might be a little small for everybody, but this is uh, on uh, global CO2 emissions. Cement manufacturing generates the most CO2 emissions per revenue dollar. So the big blue line um, is the cement industry, so that's 6.9 kilograms of CO2 per dollar. Um, chemicals below it is 0.3 kilograms CO2 emissions per dollar, even though chemicals we saw that had the highest percentage of CO2 emissions uh, in the industry uh, sector. It's interesting, I mean, we appreciate that. You can go to Lowe's or Home Depot and you can grab you a, a bag of ready-mixed concrete for, it's pretty cheap, I mean, honestly, it's really cheap. But for the amount of CO2 that's produced through calciting raw materials, the energy put into heating those materials, it, on and on, it's pretty remarkable what we actually get to pay for it. Um, so looking at decarbonizing the cement industry, um, so I've somewhat briefly touched each of these already, but there's a lot of sections we can look at, and um, at least what my group spends a lot of time on is the combustion fuel, or not the fuels, but the raw materials going into the kiln. Um, you know, those are often limestone rich, you calcite them at a certain temperature to drive off the CO2 so we have a reactive lime product, along with some other things to get the ideal phases you want for you allow your cement to harden. Um, of course, emissions related to heating this kiln and what's coming off of it, the fuels, um, and then grinding. You get the rocks that come out of the kiln are hard, you have to grind it. That takes a lot of energy. They're large. I don't know if anyone's been out to a cement kiln. I encourage you to go just because it's fascinating and I like to see industry in operation. But they're big. They put off a lot of heat. Um, and uh, they do uh, a lot of good effort on utilizing the waste heat coming off these kilns, but still, I mean, there, there's a lot of heat coming off that uh, something needs to be done with, and of course, clinker grinding. Now, I'm, I'm quoting a colleague, uh, was once my boss, uh, Tom Robel. I, I like this quote, and it's true. So, replacing and displacing Portland cement is one of the greatest materials engineering challenges of our time. Portland cement works. It works well, it's predictable, and it will do what we want it to do in, in the short term, okay? Long term, you know, we obviously know there's issues because we're always replacing and re-engineering our, our construction industry. Why settle for something that just works good enough? Because we're comfortable with it. We need to push that, especially when we're looking at decarbonizing. What other materials can we be using for our predominant engineering material uh, to build our societies. Um, and so I'll, I'll dig a little bit into the weeds now uh, on some detail. Um, so hopefully you have a full cup of coffee. We had a, a recent award that we just completed uh, last fall uh, and they asked from the uh, Department of Energy's uh, Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy, ARPA-E. Uh, they wanted an extreme durable concrete. Okay, so they were well aware of that design life needs to change hey, can you make a cement that has extreme durability? And they wanted us to focus on bailing. This is one of the hydration phases in the cement uh, that uh, provides strength. But this is a, 
Baylight versus, say, something like Alight, which hydrates quickly, gains strength quickly. Baylight is slow. It takes a lot of effort to push it down the road, but it'll get there eventually. Okay, but slow construction is not what anybody wants, so it, it's a challenge. So this is what you end up getting into. Um, so we have, in our lab, we have a batch scale kiln, so we can run these little small pellets to compare our predictive models to what is actually happening in the, in the furnace. And then we can take that, we have a pile scale rotary kiln, so we can then phase up and see uh, if our models will exist at more of a production level, uh, and then we get enough quantity to test out performance, okay? So Portland cement is typically uh, heated at around 1450 degrees Celsius. That's its manufacturing temperature. Um, and I have Baylight CSA, so that's calcium sulfur aluminate cement. Um, Portland cement, if you think of it, when it hydrates, the glue, the binder is a gel, calcium silicate hydrate gel. CSA has a phase in it called the alumite, which hydrates to form a, a hexagonal crystal called ettringite. So you can think of a Velcro structure. That's where it gets its strength, and it kicks off fast. And, it, and it's, uh, so it's a fast reacting cement, and it's strong. So that's why we coupled that slow horse, the Baylight, which uh, the we wanted, uh, had some belief that provided the durability with a, the, the high strength CSA part. And so CSAs are commercially manufactured. Uh, they are manufactured around 1250 degrees C. So obviously at a lower operating temperature than Portland cement. So there's energy savings there, uh, fuel savings as well. And the clinker that comes from a CSA, that rock that's rolling out of the kiln, is actually much softer than a Portland clinker. So it takes less energy to grind. So overall it has a less energy intensive cement. It's not used as standalone cement in the materials world, it is often added to Portland cement as a, sort of a, a set accelerator or modifier. But we can take that, so in this table here that I don't expect you to be able to see, uh, so 1250 is our standard CSA operating temperature. So we are producing some of our cements around 1050 degrees Celsius. So it doesn't seem like much, but it's actually quite a big deal if you're looking at the amount of production a cement industry goes through. So, and then the novelty that comes out of that is looking at some combinations of a, a flux to create a melt at a lower temperature, and then mineralizer to stabilize those phases at that low temperature. Um, and, and we were able to do that. It was, it was fascinating. And daylight, if you didn't know, has three different polymorphs, an alpha, beta, and a gamma. The alpha form is the most, most reactive form. So we made sure to engineer the, our daylight with that uh, alpha polymorph. So looking at, um, what that breakout is. So C2S, uh, this is um, cement notation, so I apologize to the chemists in the room, try not to make sense of it. Um, so the beta, alpha, and the gamma, but the point is, so the far two columns represent the cements we create in the lab for the, for the RPE project. Um, so I had roughly 53 and 59% baylight present, up from a, a typical CSA plant, that's a commercial plant, that's around 22% baylight. So not much, but it's present. Um, and the 41%, uh, there is uh, some cement plants that are out there doing uh, industrial test runs of some of these Baylight CSA materials. Whereas your uh, uh, Portland cement uh, has a roughly 25% um, uh, Baylight present, just to give you some difference. And so there's our cement. Doesn't look much different than Portland cement. It's gray, actually uh, performs much the same, feels the same. Smells different, I'll point out. Um, but at any rate, so it has a high Baylight content um, along with the CSA, okay? Now here's a strength, compressive strength of concrete cylinders, three inch by six inch cylinders. Uh, the light blue column on the far left, uh, dark blue on the screen, is uh, a Portland cement strength. Uh, it, so at 28 days is often a metric compressive strength for concrete. Uh, and I apologize, this is in megapascal. So that light blue one was designed for 6,000 PSI at 28 days. Um, so the next column over is a commercial CSA, calcium sulfur aluminate cement. So you can see at day one, it gained a lot more strength than Portland. That's what it's supposed to do. But then they level out and they sort of run the same uh, amount of strength gain. So take the, the next column over is our RPE cement, so the Baylight the high volume Baylight CSA cement. Um, 
So I mentioned that Baylight is a sort of a, a uh, very non-reactive phase, but we were able to push along. So right out of the gate, we had similar performance as a commercial CSA, even though it was greatly diluted compared to a 100% um, etronite CSA cement. But then you can go in and look at the chemical admixture industry is massive, and there's a lot of options. So one step into that, looking at a water-reducing admixture, is what we did to the column on the far right. And you can see our strength jumped up exponentially. Well, not exponentially, but quite a bit. Um, so the point to that is you're using a Baylight CSA cement in particular, and there's other options out there. Um, we're currently investigating a different, uh, what we call hybrid cement, so different combinations, picking out the best components of uh, what industry knows is the best uh, phases for looking at performance and durability. But what you get with this is a very dense system. Um, uh, where you have concrete failure is either, um, and I should say strength is not a marker of um, great durability over time, but it, it, what helps is the density of that material and the ability to prevent the external world from getting into it from getting into that rebar, the steel that's embedded in it. So when uh, steel sees any form of hydration or chlorides, it's going to rust, expand, crack, and so on and so forth. So anyway, this provides a very dense system that was very resistant to uh, anything externally penetrating it to break it apart. Um, and just, uh, as I mentioned it, but here's some, some numbers for you to consider. Um, this is from the International Energy Agency, DOE, and uh, this through some verbal communication with some cement plant. We're looking at the various contributions of the processes for developing the cement. The uh, net, or the total Portland, was around 1650 to 1740 pounds per ton uh, of CO2 emissions. Um, the slight dilution factor when you add gypsum, gypsum is blended into the final cement to prevent flash set. So you're looking at around 1570 to 1650 for Portland. Uh, CSA is a sulfate of cement, so you're able to add around 20% gypsum, so that brings you down around 360 to 620 pounds of CO2. So just by the nature of shifting to a different cement type has a great influence on the amount of CO2 produced. And as I mentioned, you know, why does that matter? Durable materials that last a long time, put it in, expect it to last its life, at least our lifetime, um, so we're not dealing with the extra CO2 emissions of placement, demolishing, and uh, getting the material yet again. Same idea, it'd be nice to have our iPhones more than, I don't know how many generations I'm on at this point, but, you know, durable iPhone, there you go. So now I'm showing you, you can push down that firing temperature. So, okay, great, now I have a performance product I'm creating uh, with less CO2 emissions, lower energy cost to produce it, do I still need to be using typical manufacturing technology? A big rotary kiln? I don't know, maybe not. Maybe we can look into electrification. Um, I have a picture of a conveyor belt. You know, this may not be the answer, but the point is, you know, there's probably other options out there that we can meet production needs and systems that are enclosed to uh, have better efficiency in capturing CO2 emissions. And uh, touch briefly on uh, a new area for, for my group in particular, and uh, thanks to the PPL Corporation, is in looking at CO2 mineralization um, from uh, cement manufacturing. So, but not so much as in the capturing the gas and storing it. You no, know, I'm wanting to use it. So our approach is to produce a, a value-added byproduct. So. We are capturing the CO2 and creating a carbonated product that is um, as performance strength development in uh, both Portland and CSA systems. And this is, uh, just stepped into this, uh, literally last December we started this, uh, doing this work. And we, we've had some great successes so far and uh, I'm highly anxious to keep that moving along. And some very high level summary points. Research, development, and innovation. I mean, th this is where it's at. This is what we're talking about. This is what's needed to make that change. Um, you know, let's not wait on the next COVID for decarbonization. You know, we, we have the ability and know-how now. You know, let's keep this moving. Lifestyle change. You know, you're, you live your life out of habit. Probably a lot of what you do during the day is just by nature of what you're used to doing. You know, don't have the same expectations of your, your products that you're using. Seek those low uh, low energy, low CO2 products, 
you know, drive that change. Don't just be part of the habit. I'm preaching to the choir. I learned this myself here. Um, construction expectations. You know, we are literally paving the world. Literally. It, you can't go anywhere without concrete roadways, highway expansions, parking lots. You know, fine, I get we need to do that, but you know, is there another more valuable material, less carbon intensive material we could be using? You know, nature knows best. You know, nature's been absorbing CO2 for you know a few years now. Um, and the benefit of Google is you can start checking out random thoughts. So one mature tree absorbs 48 pounds of CO2 per year. Somebody can argue me this, but all I can tell you is I looked up at the Arbor Day Foundation. So about 42 trees are needed per ton of CO2 absorption per year. So typical North American forest has 50 trees per acre. Um, of course, so naturally we can't re rely on nature to get us there. But also, fun fact, so the United States is 2.43 billion acres uh, surface area. So even if we covered the U.S. with trees instead of concrete, uh, we still wouldn't get to that 57 gigaton goal. Um, thank you. Okay, questions for Bob? Alejandro. Recently, there is a study by the Roman way of uh, doing the concrete. Um, can you comment on what would that be in terms of uh, CO2 uh, intensity for that type of? Uh... Yes, yeah, thank you. So, Roman cement concrete, right? Um, yeah, that is a common conversation right now. It's a big topic up for debate. And there is 50% of these people think this, 50% think that about Roman cement and concrete. And that's where Baylight, that DOE topic came from. Baylight uh, was one of those phases that came up with uh, uh, Roman cements. We also think a bit, you know, back in the Roman times, um, the location in which those materials were put, um, you know, what are the external uh, interactions with that? You didn't have trucks running down the roadways with the ice results. Uh, there wasn't embedded rebar. We weren't building vertical structures. They also had incredible engineers, and they were literally hand-packed a lot of those materials in, which created a very dense structure, okay? So the natural external forces um, were at a tough time getting through that. And yeah, so a lot of it is still standing. I will also point out a lot of it is not still standing, but it is, it is a very durable material, and just to prove that point that there are other options, and maybe it does go into manufacturing uh, uh, different options as well. Anyone else? Uh, yes, from the Constantin. I have a question regarding the fillers in the cement. I mean, you were talking about the durability and also preventing uh, hydration uh, during the time. So, how important would it be to apply? I mean, and probably this is already used. How important is the use of filler in the, in the cement? Great question, thank you. So filler products or supplementary cementitious materials. Um, coal ash, you live in Kentucky, or if you live in Kentucky, you have a lot of coal ash in your backyard. You'll be hard pressed to find what is termed a performance cementitious concrete that does not have fly ash in it. Why? Because it has strength over time, but it densifies the structure. And it's not just flash, there are many other fillers that go into it that are, there's fillers, but then there's, you know, reactive materials that are going into it as well. Um, there's, uh, uh, some of our cement plants are switching to um, uh, Portland uh, Type 1L, so uh, Type 1 is your typical Portland cement, but L is a limestone filler that are going into it. Um, what that allows it to do is, you know, dilute the clinker, so reduce your clinker concentration, uh, uh, so the clinker is what is the biggest energy intensity factor going into it, but you can reduce that with limestone and still see the same uh, performance uh, expectations out of the, the final concrete. So yeah, there are ways of looking at decarbonization with fillers, and there's a lot of different type of fillers out there. Um, we specialize in industrial byproduct fillers that go into it, but there's a lot of uh, synthetic ones out there as well. Um, and those do play into the story uh, for decarbonizing. That's time for one last question for Bob. Anybody?